Shortly after I got out of the Army in 1945, I fell in love with a West Madison Street hooker. She was 22, a country girl who had become streetwise, cynical, comical, and vulnerable. I didn't know she was on heroin. I'd never met a user. All I knew about drug addiction was what I'd read in the Sunday supplements. And I was too square when I did find out to grasp what that meant. No habit on earth but could not be broken by simple willpower. I really believed that and became absolutely determined to break hers. I was living in a two-room, $10 a month rear lot flat in Wabansi and Bosworth. I cut off her connection and put her to bed there. Her only protest was, I don't want you to see what I look like when I'm kicking. But she was already too sick to protest further. Did I say sick? For what began hitting that child toward evening, sick is no word. And that was only the beginning. By midnight, she'd gone blind. I was really into something now. The girl was either going to die or go mad. That was plain. I had to leave her to find help. I had never seen her connection. All I had to go on was that his name was Max. Try locating a heroin pusher named Max on West Madison between midnight and 4 a.m. some rainy morning. Can you imagine a square, still in his army jacket and fatigue cap, stopping every doorway hooker with the curious approach, uh, I'm a friend of Margot's and she needs help. They fled into the shadows. They fled into halls. They vanished in silence or just turned away. Finally, I went into a White Tower hamburger stand on the northwest corner of Aberdeen in Madison that had a full view of the street and sat there watching the night people pass in hope of spotting someone who looked like a pusher, even though I had no idea what a pusher looked like. A little lame man wearing double lens glasses and a cap shadowing his eyes came in and sat at the counter. He looked so wrong, he had to be somebody. I sat beside him, looking into the mirror, trying to catch his eye. He wasn't trying to catch mine. I didn't speak until he had a cup of coffee almost to his lips. I'm a friend of Margot's, I told him softly. She needs help. The cup clattered against his teeth. He had to put it down to keep from spilling it. It took him a minute to get up his nerve to look at me in the mirror. Then he looked relieved. She ought to know better than to send a square down here. He was Max. We heard her calling feebly for help before we opened my door. She had thrown herself out of the bed and, having no strength to get back in, was lying blindly, face down, in a pool of her own perspiration. What do you think you're doing? Max began scolding her before he touched her. And a kind of miracle happened. A faint pink flush touched her cheeks at the sound of his voice. A faint smile came to her mouth. And by the time we had her back on the bed, she'd begun getting well before the needle had touched her. Did you see that? I saw it all right. And I still blessed that small, begoggled outcast. And when I read one of those scapegoat pieces about the viciousness of drug pushers and extolling the basic humanitarianism of the narc squad hero, I'm saddened. Because it isn't Margo and it isn't Max who keeps the traffic moving. It's that same narc squad hero with a small brown paper bag that hustlers and pushers alike have to keep filled if they want to stay on the street. Mm -hmm.